Welcome to month nine of Maddie's Baking Book Club. This month, September 2023, we read the book Sweet Bean Paste. This story was chosen by my friend Amber, um, and she is living in Japan currently. And this book is a book originally written in Japanese and has been translated into English. In this story, the main character is working in a dorayaki shop. Dorayaki is a pancake, like a small pancake sort of dough, and then it is sandwiched with bean paste traditionally on the inside and then another uh, little pancake on the other side. It is so so delicious. If you've never tried the real thing, you absolutely have to give it a try. So because of the setting of so much of the story being revolving around this uh, dorayaki shop, I really wanted to make a macaron version of dorayaki. So to start off with, I am making a dorayaki macaron shell, a pancake looking macaron shell. So I use some brown and a little bit of yellow to create a very light brown macaron batter. And then I split the batter in about half and added more brown to half of the batter. Then I am going to macronage just like I would for any of my regular macaron batter to both of the bowls. Now, because I didn't want this to be a chocolate brown, I wanted it to be that like baked bread, you know, pancake color of brown, I ended up adding quite a bit more yellow to give it that more dough look instead of the chocolate look. And honestly, I'm so happy with this color combination. I think it worked really well. So I started off by using powdered food colorants. And then when I got to the end here, when I was so close to being done, I used gel food colorants to help them incorporate in a bit more smoothly. Now it's time to pipe the macaron shell. So I have these two different colors of batter. And because I want the outside edge to be the lighter brown, I'm starting off by piping a little bit of that lighter macaron batter, almost as if I'm creating a mini macaron, making sure to stay inside the lines of my regular circle template. Then after I get through my tray, make sure that you're not waiting too long. Uh, You don't want this to start forming a skin. I'm going in right on top of that in the center and piping that darker brown because just like when you are making a pancake or any kind of dough on a griddle, the flat part that is touching the hot griddle is going to develop this really nice golden brown color and then the dough that is on the outside that isn't touching that hot surface is going to remain much lighter so that was my goal was to have the brown stretch all the way to the outside I didn't want this to be like a bullseye I really wanted it to look like a pancake I think I achieved that. I was really, really nervous that it would look really stupid or it would be really hard to guess what it was. But even as I was piping these first few, I knew it was exactly what I pictured in my mind. So I was filming this and I wanted a couple different angles, which is why I only piped half the tray. But I definitely recommend after doing like one tray or half a tray, if you're piping a bit more slowly, to alternate your colors because if you piped all of your trays, if you're doing a huge batch and you do all of that light color and then you try to go in with that darker color, if a skin has started to form, they are not going to meld together as well as they could or should. And that would be really disappointing. You might end up with some weird cracks or things might happen during the baking process. So I definitely recommend doing this one tray tray or half a tray at a time. After piping all of the macarons both colors, I let these rest on my counter just like I would any other batch of macarons for me in my kitchen. That's about 20 to 25 minutes on that first tray. And then I got them into my oven for me about 17 minutes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit.
for the buttercream. I wanted to stick with that pancake taste inside as well as with the macaron appearance. So I am using an ermine style buttercream, which is a flour based buttercream. And instead of using flour, I am using pancake mix. And I picked a pancake mix that had a lot of like flavors in it. It wasn't just like a straight up like flour and sugar pancake mix, but this one had like buttermilk and like I think some maple in there. So it really is giving pancake vibes. So I'm just heat treating that a little bit in my pan, then adding in some brown sugar for a little bit of that molasses flavor. Then I am going to cook this with some cream and milk until it thickens up quite a bit and it looks more like a pudding than this sort of milky liquid that we have right here in the beginning. After this thickens up, I am going to take it off the heat and let it cool completely. I You want it to be at least under 30 degrees Celsius, but you can also cover it with plastic wrap after it's cooked and get it into your refrigerator to use later that day or the next day, depending on your schedule and what works best for you. Once the flour mixture has cooled down, you can start whipping up your butter until it is really nice and fluffy. Then you can pour in either all of the flour mixture or a little bit at a time and whip it into the butter. Now this is really, really thick, um, so it didn't have a very satisfying pour into the butter, but the flavor was perfect. It absolutely tastes like pancake buttercream. I was so, so happy with this. Just like with any buttercream, you might want to switch over from the whisk attachment to a paddle attachment to make sure you're getting the smoothest, creamiest buttercream you possibly can. Now, the last thing I wanted to fill these macarons with was, of course, bean paste or a sort of red bean mixture. And I did not have the time to properly create my own. So I am using this uh, Korean, actually, red bean paste. I probably could have st stuck with the theme a little bit better and found a Japanese version. But I am using this one. The one that I picked actually also had some little pieces of chestnut in it. So the flavor was absolutely out of this world. Then I'm just piping that pancake buttercream around the outside of the shell and after that is all ready I'll scoop in some of the red bean right into the center. If you wanted to you absolutely could add the bean paste right into the buttercream if you just want to pipe one bulb of buttercream and still get all of the flavor in there. Now the red bean paste that I chose does have a bit of texture to it. There are some whole or partially, you know, still together beans in there. And then there are some that have kind of become softer and disintegrated a bit. So depending on the consistency, that might give you the right texture that you're looking for. I really love that texture or you can blend this up. You could puree that in a food processor. If you're making your own, you can cook it and food process it accordingly, depending on how much texture you want, how thick you want that paste to be.
Now I'm just going to sandwich up all of these little dorayaki macarons here, get them into my refrigerator, and then make sure to give them about 24 to 48 hours to mature completely. Sometimes buttercream filled macarons take a little bit longer than a ganache filled macaron to mature, and then they'll be ready to eat. I cannot wait to share after this little macaron tutorial. I have a discussion with my friend Amber who chose this book. We talked extensively about the story and I am so so excited to share all of our thoughts with you. Seriously, look at how cute these are. Even if you have never seen real dorayaki in life or online, you could probably guess that this is somehow pancake related. It, it just turned out so perfectly. All right, enough with the macarons, on to the book discussion. Hi, Very Amber. Hi, <laughs> Mary. Welcome. Thank you for coming back. Anybody who is watching might remember Amber from January's first Maddie's Baking Book Club. So thank you for returning. <laughs> Amber, thank can you... you for asking me again. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you introduce yourself for anyone who might not recognize you? Mm -hmm. Yep. So my name is Amber, and I have been an English teacher for seven years in the, both the U.S. and Japan and the virtual world. And now I live in rural Tokushima prefecture which is in, on a southern the southern island of Shikoku in Japan and, and I love books <laughs> yes <laughs> you read a lot um and we tend mm. to have slightly different styles for as much as we both mm. read um and you chose mm. today's book the last book discussion we did I chose the mm. book Arsenic and Adobo and this time you selected this book. So can you tell me what drew you to this book? How did you find out about it? Uh huh. Yeah, so it's kind of random, but I love, I this past like maybe a couple of years, I've been really into reading newly, Japanese works that have been newly translated into mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. um, my Japanese is not quite at the level where I have read a book in Japanese before, but it just takes more brain. It's not as relaxing as reading a book in English. It takes a lot of brain power. <laughs> Um, but I, there's a lot of Japanese authors I really enjoy. And so reading um, books in translation, I always see this this book, Sweet Bean Paste, is mm. always like a recommended title of, mm -hmm. if you like this book, try this book. Mm. You know, if you like this author, mm -hmm. read this one. And so it's been in the back of my mind for, I would say, the past year. And so when you asked me, I was I immediately thought, like, <laughs> Japan, sweet bean paste. <laughs> Definitely. baking <laughs> maddie eating yeah so i think i saw yeah, was this in japanese it was originally written in 2013 is yeah, that true it was maybe like 10 years over 10 but years ago i think yeah more recently translated into english so kind of like yes. newer on the scene of mm -hmm. japanese english literature mm -hmm. yes yeah. yeah. And I also, I just love sweet bean paste, like the real thing. So yes, I even experience. just like from the title, when you sent it to me, like before even mm -hmm. looking at the book description, I was like, yes, let's do that. Like I'm in. I, yeah. I was so excited to find out more. Um, before we get into a discussion, can you give a little synopsis? What is this book about? Yeah, and I actually read it a few months ago, so I can't really remember anyone's name. That's but okay. That's okay. I'm just I'm just <laughs> gonna use what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, Sweet Bean Paste is about. It opens with the main the protagonist mm -hmm. is kind of like a middle aged ex felon sent like out of prison. I yes. I don't think we ever got his like precise age. It didn't really matter. But yeah, we know he's like not young, not old. Yeah, yeah, somewhere in the middle, yes. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I sort of imagined him as late 30s, which I should not call middle age <laughs> as someone who's also in their 30s. So yeah, anyways, yeah. the protagonist is has this sort of dark background, like troubled background. Mm -hmm. um, but And he's working like um, a job he doesn't really 
care about, but he is doing it for the money. He's making mm. dora, dorayaki, which is like a, a Japanese sweet. It's like a pancake with sweet red bean paste inside. So good. Um, and so he runs this dorayaki stand and he doesn't really have any necessarily particularly like ambitions for the dorayaki stand. He's just doing it for the money. And then one day this little old lady comes mm-hmm. and she buys some dorayaki and she says, the sweet bean paste is terrible. The pancakes are pretty good. You know, the pancake part is delicious, but I can tell that the, the sweet bean paste is store-bought. She asked him, like, true. right he, away, like, did you buy yes. this? Which is like, no! Yes, like, I know you bought this, and I know the beans are imported, like, the cheap ones from China or something. And he's like, yep, what do you want, lady? Like, I'm, this is not my calling. I buy the, I buy the bean paste already made. And she says, like, you know, try some of mine. And so she gives him some of hers and it's like amazing and he takes mm. one bite it's otherworldly um and so she convinces him even though he's reluctant at first to hire her on for mm-hmm. very low wage to make the sweet bean paste from hand in the mornings and so yeah from there the story is just about their relationship and what they learn from each other and which like yeah. speaking of the low wage I did want to touch on this with you mm-hmm. because I find it so interesting so this guy mm-hmm. the main character Sentaro he is like mm-hmm. oh we are looking because like there was a sign in the window and she's like mm-hmm. I want to work here in her hands we get this description that they're like super gnarled and he's like I don't think she mm-hmm. can physically work and so when mm-hmm. she's like I want a job he's like how would you help me like, this seems pointless. And he's like, I can only offer you 600 yen an hour. And this is 10 years ago. Um, but still, 600 yen an hour, that's like five US dollars. Like, it is mm-hmm. not, even then, that is mm-hmm. way less than American minimum wage. And they end up settling for like 200 yen an hour, like a yeah, dollar like, 50 an hour. Like, like what really is low. this? But a minimum wage standards in Japan. I find to be surprisingly different from the U.S. Like, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. So I don't know what it was 10 years ago in 2012, 2013 when this book was written, but now it still is surprisingly cheap. And I think it might depend on the prefecture. Mm -hmm. In Tokushima, I think it's last time I checked, Mm -hmm. I think it was around 700 yen. So again, like, okay. So it's still literally low. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so pretty low. And I mean, the cost of living in the in the rural areas is quite different. $6 an hour is still too low, but yeah. it, it is not quite as cheap as I think $6 in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, but it does not. I don't I can't say for certain, but whatever arrangement they come to does not feel super legal to me. It so, does not feel that super is legal. Something I yes. was serious. Yes. About. Yeah. So yeah. yes, it's, Sentaro is somewhere like, probably mm. like, 38 to 45 it's like what I feel like in my brain mm-hmm. is like so uh-huh. he is like that age um and then um what's her name Tokue the older woman mm-hmm. is like in her 70s like mid to late 70s and so as far as their age difference um and this kind of becomes important later on in the story that like she could basically be his mom as far as mm-hmm. age goes. And so in the beginning when he has all of the power being like, you can't work here, like this is no. And like kind of trying to get her to go away. It's like kind of this weird, like who are you to tell this old woman like what she can and cannot do. But at the same time, like she's in her like mid to late seventies and is crippled basically. Like maybe she shouldn't be working. It's yeah, kind of a, a a rough beginning to the story. Yeah, and he has, you can tell he has like complicated feelings about both of that because when it talks about her her physical disability, her hands mm-hmm. being really, they keep using the word gnarled, right? Yeah. And so part of him is like disgusted, right? Like he feels like he doesn't want customers to see yes. someone working yes. with yeah. a disability. And so we don't like that side of him. But then another part of him is also worried, right? Like, can she do it? Like, is she going to be okay? Like, I don't want to make this right. elderly woman almost like caretaking who is yes. going to hurt. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that is also these characters. I mean, it's not that long of a book, but it is. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of, I don't know. I liked that the author 
made everyone very human and <laughs> there are sides to the protagonist that we don't like how yeah. like how he's embarrassed <laughs> of her hands and how he doesn't want customers to see her yes right. A lot of we don't see him fully as a you know monster. True, true. A lot of I feel like the humanity of everyone Mm -hmm. and the mixture of like kind of almost like fantastical, um, really complex situations mixed with like incredibly mundane things felt Mm -hmm. like very Japanese. Like reading this, even if you removed all of the words like dorayaki and okonomiyaki and the places and the cherry blossoms, if you took all of those away and replaced it with more neutral like ice cream or like, you know, I don't know, those words, Mm -hmm. I think I still would have been like a Japanese author wrote this. Like (laughs) this is so Japanese. There's there's something like so, it's just so daily life. You know what I mean? And there's not like a huge, I mean, I don't, want to spoil the ending or anything no it's okay it's spoiler like alerts at this point climax. yeah it's fine. Okay. it's fine <laughs> yeah I mean obviously there is like kind of a climax when Tokue passes away mm-hmm. and they go you know he and the high school girl go to visit them and find out you know and read this letter it's kind of like the emotional climax of the story mm-hmm. but there's not like a big turning point there's not like a big dramatic turning point yeah like I think a lot of non-Japanese literature has that makes it sense. ended in a very open-ended way you're right there was that like emotional climax but then it kind of left the reader with this like there mm-hmm. are all of these ambiguous ways the story might go but we don't know mm-hmm. we yeah. like we have some resolve but mostly not we know how some things aren't going to end up because you know Tokue passes away Sentaro quit his job. Mm-hmm. Wakane, the girl. Um, I think so, I think yeah. that's her name. Um, she is going to school part-time because she has to work to help her family. But mm-hmm. then, like, that, that's all. It just ends. And I feel like, I don't know if it was because the book felt so intensely, like, this Japanese style of writing to me. I feel like in a lot of other books, I would have been like no, I want more. (laughs) I want to know what happens. Mm -hmm. I was very okay with how this ended. Though, I was quite shocked. I think you know me from our time that we've spent together even recently. I feel like I'm pretty good at predicting how medical situations are going to go. Like, I, I did not expect we were going to dive into leprosy quite so hard. That was a twist I did not see coming. Uh-huh. What okay. about you? I have I have a lot of things to say. Okay, okay. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is that going back to this idea where there's not like a big turning point and there's yes. not really a resolution to a lot of things in the characters' lives, I, I think that that is something that I've seen a lot in like the translated works that mm. I've read recently. Um, whereas I feel like a lot of writer other writers would ha- like have an ending, right? Even yes. if it's not like super happy it would sort of be resolved in at least some capacity and this is very open-ended but I've I actually I really liked this ending Mm -hmm. and I felt like it echoed real life right like we don't know if Centauro went on and like opened up his own door right like we can like you want him to Uh, like I want him to to. (laughs) or became a writer or whatever yeah or we don't know if Wakana you know like also got into really into Dorayaki and kept making it in right? Tokue's honor. Yeah. Like we don't have that. But I think that, I think it really spoke to the one of the main themes of the book, which is like, you don't have to do something special with your life for life to be meaningful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And people make mistakes and they don't, their dreams don't work out and your life is still precious. Mm-hmm, and I really like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to say. Yeah. And the leprosy thing... Okay, so I worked for three years in the Japanese yeah. public school system yeah. on the JET program. And I would, so Japanese public school students, they all have to study something called dotoku, mm-hmm. which is, can be translated as moral education. So they have dotoku class, I think about okay. once a week. Yeah. And so there are all these different topics. They like learn about bullying and discrimination. Uh-huh. And one of the topics that they learn about, because I would go to the dotoku class and listen to the presentations and talk to the kids. One of the things they learn about a lot is leprosy. It's Hansanbyo in Japanese. Hansanbyo, yeah. 
And I was what? always like, why are we learning about leprosy so much? Like in my head, it, I know that, you know, people were discriminated yeah, against. Yeah. And I, I have a vague understanding of like leprosy colonies in the past, even in like, I think Hawaii, one of the Hawaiian islands also was like a very famous leprosy col- colony. Um, but I was like, why is this in, in the curriculum? Like in Which I, I suppose <laughs> if like, as the story mentioned, I, I feel like there, it was accurate because the author's note at the end, he seems mm-hmm. to have done a lot of in-person research, which I love. Mm-hmm. Um, but the like laws regarding people with, I guess mm-hmm. it's now called Hansen's disease. I, I don't know when that changed. Yeah. Um, but the whatever like leprosy whatever act in Japan was only ended yeah. in 1996. Like that's yeah. so recent. Yeah. <laughs> that's no, so Japanese. That. Like what is Japan? Yes, I like read that part of the book. I got to like that line, and I was like, oh, no, like, something clicked in me, and I was like, this is why all the junior high school kids. Still this learn is why about we're it talking about it. About it it's recent. It's like that was like my lifetime. Like, yes. Right. Like yes. We were oh, alive. Like, yeah. Were yeah. That, these, that this all changed, you know, and even though, you know, I, I think this is true for like all sorts of discrimination, right? Mm-hmm. Like gender discrimination, racial discrimination. But even when the laws change officially, there's like a time period where there's still so much personal discrimination that people right. are holding on to, even if it's not legal, right? There's still systemic and personal bias, you know, systemic issues and personal biases that don't go away just because you've changed the law right. or repealed, you know, whatever leprosy act they had in place. Yeah. And so I can imagine that there would still be such discrimination present yeah. that it would be really important to include in the curriculum. Yeah. So reading that like really clicked for me. And I remember like calling me to hear my husband from like the other room when I got to that part of the book. And I was like, <laughs> Japan had this leprosy law until 1996. And he was, he was like, yeah, that's why we do so much of it in school. And I was really surprised. And it also made so wow. much sense at the same time. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And now I feel like I need to do more research into like, what was the situation <laughs> in the U S because like, I've, I've literally, mm-hmm. it's never crossed my mind. Mm-hmm. Like I, yeah. if you had ever brought up the subject of leprosy or I guess mm-hmm. Hansen's disease, I thought it was something of like long ago. Like it, it, it did not also, even enter my brain yeah. that it could happen in my lifetime of reality. So mm-hmm. yeah, that was interesting. I did yeah. not expect it to take over the book. On the back cover, we mm-hmm. get this idea that we know Tokue has a quote unquote dark secret. Which, of course, mm-hmm. ends up being that she lives in, like, a sanatorium for people who mm-hmm. have had leprosy. Um, but I did not have any inkling that that's where we were going. But it's a huge deal because she is working at this dorayaki shop. And somebody is like, oh, my God, this woman is disfigured because of leprosy. And so suddenly mm-hmm. it's a huge deal because she's pressured into not working there the like owner of the shop is like really upset that she ever worked there at all. They lose a ton of customers because Mm -hmm. of social pressure and fear. Um, But it really throws a wrench into their like developing relationship and they're like kind of working on their own like self Mm. goals and whatever. So yeah, it ended up being a very like fundamental piece of this story. And that also felt like a very, I don't want to say realistic, because maybe that's depressing. But when Sentaro, Mm -hmm. the owner of the shop, tells Sentaro, like, you need to let her go. Like, she cannot work here anymore. Yeah, I can't believe you hired her already. And he kind of sticks up for her, right? And she says, like, but her her bean paste is so good. Yeah, yeah. the customers love it. She is safe. She is healthy. He, like, researches it and explains, like, you know, she's keyword she's in remission like it's not contagious blah 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 and the owner like doesn't care she's like you need to let her her go and you know as the reader we're rooting for him to be like no take a stand yeah 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 quit alongside and he just like goes home and And drinks yeah he (laughs) goes home and drinks and then kind of you know tokue kind of finds out about the situation and she's kind of like i don't want to cause problems i'll just go away and as the reader that's like so kind of disappointing but then you're like how many times has that happened in real life right like a person who's facing discrimination it's they're kind of like 
not you to it, but it, it's just so they've faced these obstacles their entire life, right? And so to Sentaro, it's like the first time he's kind of seen right. this play out. But to Tokue, it's it's been her whole life, right? And she's like, I, you know, I don't want to cause problems. I don't want to deal with anything. This again, I don't want to cause a big thing. I'll just leave. Which also, like for and her, for really Tokue, yeah, she was working for literally the first time, despite being in her mid seventies. Mm-hmm. She, you know, caught this disease when she was fourteen. And had lived in mm-hmm. isolation for the entire duration of her life. She has basically no real world experience outside of this little closed off, basically, community she's been in. And so for her, like just being able to have this part time job making like a dollar an hour is like a dream come true, which is both like so sweet and heartwarming and also like devastatingly sad that that is her reality but for Mm -hmm. her also I feel like she didn't take a stand because she is like I have had 50 years of Mm -hmm. coming to terms with my reality and she wasn't like at when this happened she was not like on her deathbed like she was pretty healthy in that moment but she was also like realistically I don't have a lot of time left, like all things considered. Mm -hmm. So taking a stand and fighting for this job, it's not worth the trouble. And especially I feel like this is going to stereotype, but in Japan, this idea of like uh, thinking of others, not causing waves is even much more of a strong feeling than it might have been with people in the U.S. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you can see how even the laws have changed. This discrimination just keeps happening, just keeps right? happening because mm-hmm. of the social pressure and yeah. the social pressure to kind of just make problems go away if someone decide, you know, higher up decides it's a mm-hmm. problem. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how much you know about Buraku Sabetsu. Do you know about like the the, the like Buraku mean like yeah, against Buraku mm-hmm, mean? Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. A lot of times it's called Doa Mondai now. Okay. Um, but it's like the same kind of thing where Japan had a caste system and there were like untouchables at, like the, at the bottom, very bottom. Did, you mm-hmm. know, dirty jobs like slaughtering cattle or tanning leather or, mm-hmm. you know, preparing mm-hmm. bodies for burial. And those, I mean, that, that caste system was outlawed to, I want to say 200 years ago with the Meiji Reformation, but like kids also still learn about that discrimination in school because it's still, especially in rural areas like this, like, there are certain neighborhoods, and family history, knows, you know, and like a people. When. Yeah, it's yep, that was the strangely persistent. Yeah, it is very persistent, and I I kind of felt the same way about this, right? Like it's such an old problem. Although in this case, the you know 1996 is actually pretty recent, yeah. but, <laughs> but still. it's been a problem for a long time. The laws have changed, and we there's still this really devastating social reality mm-hmm. that is different from the actual law. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so very, very interesting topics. One mm-hmm. thing um, I did want to talk with you about, so as I was reading this, like a lot of stories um, that use words, especially translated works, that it was important to keep some terms or things from the original text. So we have words like dorayaki and okonomiyaki that are in italics and they describe what it is to us, but we don't really have a word for it in English and it's more meaningful to keep that original term. In one paragraph though, when the the owner of the store, she is talking at Sentaro, not really having a conversation with him, but she's like, we are not selling enough. You are not selling enough. This isn't working. We should scrap this dorayaki. We should stop selling sweet things. We should sell savory things. You would like that, wouldn't you, because of alcohol? And so she keeps pushing him to be like, let's sell okonomiyaki. And in one paragraph, she was like, use the word okonomiyaki. And then she said, and octopus balls. And I was yeah, like, I whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Why are we not saying, using both Japanese words and saying okonomiyaki for the savory pancake and then saying mm. takoyaki for takoyaki. Octopus. Like, why yeah. Why are we choosing one and not the other? And I wanted to ask you if that stood out to you and what you thought about that because 
I thought the book was so well translated. Like I thought they really grasped like Japanese like sentence mm-hmm. structure even in some places and like tone. But that was one that was like, who made this choice and why? <laughs> okay, that also stood out to me because okay. it sounds bad in English. It does. Right? Like it, octopus it, ball, for sure it does. Eat something that's called octopus ball, like probably not. Uh, no. But takoyaki is delicious, right? It's so good. Should we describe takoyaki, takoyaki for anyone who Love. knows? What's, takoyo- what's takoyaki? takoyaki? So it's basically a savory <laughs> pancake, but you make it in this um, like hemisphere mold. So you put in the batter and then you put pieces of octopus and then the way it's turned as it's cooked, it creates a sphere. And then there's sauce and there's, you know, all kinds of like cheese inside too. Sometimes it's like, you don't have to do octopus, in. but yeah. usually it is. And then yeah, other flavors and you eat it. And like 90% of the time you burn your tongue because you're too excited because it's too delicious. And then it's like molten hot inside. Um, but it's so good. And calling it octopus balls seems silly and also like if you directly translate it like taco is octopus and yaki is the fried portion so takoyaki you could just say fried octopus it's not really because it's, it's a dough but it's but there's no there's no than ball, octopus ball. Yeah. in it so yeah it was weird no oh, that did stick out to me and the only thing i can think of is that okonomiyaki comes up so many times you know mm, what i mean it's a repeat word in the okay. owner's conversations yep. he has yep. a repeat word so yep. maybe that's why they chose to just say okonomiyaki um, but I'm not sure why they went with taco balls or octopus balls. And the other thing is that now that you say that, it actually makes me wonder. So the Japanese title of this book is just on, which is the okay. Japanese word for like the sweet, sweet bean paste. You know, red yep. A literal, paste. literal. But then they translate that to sweet bean paste. And I'm wondering, do you, that must have been a very intentional choice. Right. I mean, do you think if that I is? came across a book and it was just called yeah. on, I might be a lot less curious than I would be if I saw it called sweet bean paste. Mm. So that's very true. And on sounds like a name. It does. English, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other one, speaking of names, so mm. the high school last year of middle school, which in the US is usually freshman year of high school girl, mm-hmm. um, what's her I name? Wakana. 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 Yeah. Um, she has this bird. And because mm. it starts singing a lot, she can't keep it. And Sentaro can't keep it in the shop for like food safety concerns. And he can't keep it in his apartment because of noise. So they decide to bring it to the sanatorium so Tokue can keep mm. it in her home. Um, and at the very end, we learn that Tokue let the bird go. Um, she listened, right? Capital L listened to it and it was telling her, I want to be free. So she let it be free. And the woman who was telling Sentaro and Wakana about the fact that Tokwe let it go is like stumbling over the name and they're like reminding her like, oh yeah, the bird's name is Marvi? Mar- Marvi? It, it is, right? I took a, I I took think, a I picture of so. it because I was like, what? Um... Marvy, M-A-R-V-Y. And that wow. one, I was like, who chose this name? Is this in katakana? Mm-hmm. Because like, how do you even spell that in Japanese? Because so many of those sounds don't exist. Uh-huh. Did you have thoughts? Like, did that? I don't know. I, I did have thoughts. I think people name their pets a lot of weird stuff. Okay. So <laughs> I assumed that it was in katakana, like, Marubi. Marubi. Right, Waterby, like and then with maybe the, the like little had to choose like oh, is it a V? Is it a B? Like a is it a, a yeah, yeah, so yeah? Is it an R or an L? L? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. But I don't envy translating the job of having to translate. I stuff like that, that was one so instance. Many weird yeah, things. I really wanted yeah. to look at the trid like act the first mm. Japanese edition, and I wanted to flip through and say, wait, what was this bird's name? Like, how are we translating mm. this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Yes. Can I ask you Yes, a please do. <laughs> so one of the criticisms about this book, um, and I heard this going into it, was that yeah. it kind of uses the character of Tokue as like the all-knowing, wise, mm-hmm. elderly person mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who like kind of not sacrifices herself, but like dies in the end, right? Yeah. But like the point 
of her, you know, existence in the novel is to like teach Sentaro, like, right, like open him up and like mm-hmm. show him how precious life is, even if you're just making, you know, Doriaki pancakes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. every day for a low wage, you yeah. know, you should treasure everything. And it does come across heavy handed at times, mm-hmm. right? Like the long letters and it didn't feel super unrealistic. Like I could imagine, you know what I mean? Someone having this like deep connection and having these conversations um but what what did you think about that did you feel like Tokue was like a fully formed character in her own Mm. right or did you feel like she was kind of like a not a caricature but like a uh a plot development that's a good question I I feel like because of how short the book was I felt like it was reasonable Mm -hmm. I feel like Mm -hmm. if it had been much longer I might have expected us to know more but like even with our main character Sentaro like we don't even know that much more about him like Mm -hmm. (laughs) so Mm -hmm. it felt kind of equal in my mind like we know Mm -hmm. certain amounts about you know all of the characters and we kind of have these huge gaping holes of you know lack of information about all of them as well um I also think that like Tokwe being like all knowing and so wise and she had all these letters and the fact that she communicated that way. I don't I feel like it was reasonable. I also feel like the way that she and Sentaro kind of formed this relationship where she was teaching him, she was desperate for a family. He was desperate mm-hmm. for a mom who had passed away when he was in prison. Um she mentions in one of her later letters or maybe even in person that her husband who also had leprosy and they were in this community together was forcibly sterilized. And Mm -hmm. so they were not allowed to have children. And I think that that was much more of a hurdle that she had already coped with like a trauma. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Mm -hmm. when she saw Sentaro and with his age and with where they were in life, I feel like it's really reasonable that she was like, you are the son I never had. I was not allowed to have. Um, And then with the young girl who was the same age as she was when she got sick, it was like, oh my God, flashback to everything. I wish I could live my life as you, but like not as a leper. I don't know. So, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I agree. I actually had similar feelings. I was wary about her being like this all-knowing, you know, elderly woman who just magically swoops in and gives great advice. But I also, I also think it was reasonable. I think that I really agree with what you said about like, we don't know that much about any of the characters. We just, it's mostly about their relationship, right? Not their like, you know, backgrounds. And actually, I think we know more about Tokue's background than even like Sentaro's background. You know, like, we don't know why. Yeah. Um, we don't know a lot about him actually, even though he's the main character. And I guess I, on the one hand that is kind of heavy handed, but on the other hand, like I have had relationships in my life where I met, I've been gotten really close with someone very quickly Mm -hmm. and had this sort of like special, like surrogate. I mean, I, I am, have a very close relationship with both of my parents and family, but especially living in Japan, have had, like, kind of surrogate, auntie, parent, grandparent people in my life. You do. I've met some of them. Yes. You have met some of them. Yeah. And they talk like this. They give me advice, like, after their child. Yes. And, like, you know, right. So it's kind of mutual. It's not like you're, it's not like you're just randomly, like, she's my Japanese mom. No, it's, like, a mutual, like, Amber's my, like, American kid. Yeah. 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 And so I think because I've had relationships with people like this and I still, you know, I still do, I could, it did seem more realistic to Mm -hmm. me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that this actually does happen in real life. You know what I mean? You have a, anything I say just sounds corny. I want to say like a special (laughs) connection with someone, you know? No, I get it. I I felt the same way. Yeah. You both like learn from each other. I think it does happen in real life and it almost is like, I don't want to say stranger than fiction, but yeah, you put it in a book and you're kind of like, this seems unrealistic, but I think it is realistic actually. Yeah. 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 One thing that I do want to touch on, and I wanted to ask your opinion Mm -hmm. out, but about, but I want to be a little bit careful both because of monetization rules on YouTube and also Uh like trigger warning. Um, Uh 
there was a lot of self-harm ideation, Mm -hmm. um, particularly from the perspective of Sentado. Like several times he is thinking about ending his life Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. passing. Um, But Mm -hmm. like really like thinking it out loud and especially considering we don't know a lot about him, we hear a lot about that. And we hear from other characters that they have had similar thoughts and then we also know that Sentado clearly has issues with drinking and his boss who had helped him out, who passed away, basically passed away from complications of alcoholism. Um, mm-hmm. So there are some like really heavy things that, especially with Sentado, it seems like there's a lot of like maybe depression at play as well, anxiety, like social anxiety issues as well. And... I thought it was a little bit hard as a reader. You mentioned earlier on that there are things that we don't like about him as a main character, but that aren't Mm. like terrible. He's not a terrible human being, but he's not a perfect human being. So in a way, it makes him as a character more well-rounded and real, but also as a reader was a little bit like, oh no, like, can we get you into a therapist? Like... I, mm-hmm. I need you to be having more support than you have as, as mm-hmm. a human. What what were your thoughts on those passages in the book? I felt the same way about those passages as when he fails to stand up for Tokue. Yeah. And with, you know, how the book handles discrimination and how it's like a problem and we want people to, you know, stand up and do what's right. And then people are kind of in the middle, right? Like you said, they're not terrible monsters. They're not heroes it was kind of disappointing (laughs) in a lot of cases and I kind of felt the same way about this I I actually think that like depression and mental health issues and alcoholism Mm -hmm. is like a huge problem in Japan and I mean also America but (laughs) just specifically in the context of this book like I think there's a huge mental health crisis that goes on and it's not as common as it is in the U.S. to be like I'm depressed I'm struggling. I need, I need help. I need yeah. support. Yeah. I am going to get therapy. Yeah. I am going to go see a doctor. I think it's changing. And I don't know what it's like in bigger cities. Yeah. But I think it definitely is very, very, very underdiagnosed and very, very, very not much talked about, mm-hmm. but is an issue affecting a lot of people. And I also think that there's a lot of isolation in mm. Japanese society mm-hmm. now. And again, I, I'm not trying to say anything anything in comparison to America. I also think that we have a lot of isolation (laughs) and similar problems in the U S. Um, but I think, and this book takes place in Tokyo, right? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, my friends who live in Tokyo have talked about some of the same struggles themselves, not quite to this extent, but like, you know, they go to work. It's, it's a very stressful work work culture. Yep. You go to work, you are home, you go home. And then maybe you stop at a bar on the way home, right? And that's, like, your one little time of, like, doing something that's not at work or sleeping at home. And maybe you still don't talk to anybody else there. You are just, like, yes, there. (laughs) Yep, nope. Yep, you're just there. Yeah, and so I think that there's a lot of social isolation is becoming a big, bigger and bigger problem here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As work culture gets busier and as technology advances, it's like we're more connected in some ways and like mm-hmm. less connected mm-hmm. than ever before. And yeah, so I did, of course, I was very concerned as the reader, like you're saying, yeah. you're like, go get help. And at the end, you're like, I want you to like have found a counselor. Mm, do and, it. Yes. <laughs> and do a healthy life or check yourself into rehab or something. Find and some friends. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's not how it ends at yeah. all. And the, you know, the relationship, the one important relationship that he formed with Tokue is now kind of gone because she's passed away. Right. Um, and Wakana, the high school student is not really, I mean, she's, High she's school, a kid so. she's like she's a kid. yeah <laughs> they're not like supporting each other they have they yeah. also have a relationship but they're not you know supporting each other yeah. emotionally um yeah and so I think it is I feel like it's depressing and mm-hmm. also kind of realistic mm-hmm. and I I think it kind of ties in to the one so not silver lining the one like little glimmer of hope I feel mm-hmm. is that the I mean, Tokoe's message is all about, like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be amazing. 
to treasure your life. And yeah. I do feel like that is one change we get in Sentaro towards the end of the book is that he's kind of also accepted Tokue's worldview and is thinking of, you know, no matter what he does next, mm-hmm. he wants to, you know, cherish yes. the daily I think like, that's a good word more, to like use. just being alive. I yeah. feel like at the beginning of the story, we found him... Um, I, I think you could label it as depression, but I think that he is like mm-hmm. almost robotic in what he does. Mm-hmm. Like he does not care that he uses like store-bought bulk bean paste. He could care less. He doesn't care mm-hmm. about dorayaki. He doesn't eat the confections that he makes. He barely cares about his customers. He's annoyed by everyone. He just like is like sleeping through his life. And at the end, yeah, he's like using these lessons from Tokue. What can I listen to? What can I hear? What can I observe? What could I do differently? What could I do better? And not huge things, but like tiny little things. And like, how could I enjoy Mm -hmm. this little moment or something? So yeah, I I Mm -hmm. do think we saw this like evolution and like positive change by the end of the story, I do think he's paying mm-hmm. attention or like more in tune with his own life and with his own feelings because he does quit his job. The, mm-hmm. the woman who owns the store, um, she brings on her nephew and it was just like, I feel like classic like kitchen world. It was one moment I felt like I understood. <laughs> and Um, she's like this is my nephew his personality is so bad nobody else will work with him and he's just like yeah (laughs) that's me (laughs) that's me and so she's like we're gonna switch this to an okonomiyaki shop because that's something that he can do and it was just like what and then she's like but can you train him though and it's like Mm -hmm. what so you have this kid who's like by all accounts like a terrible person terrible to work with but we'll change the business for him. But also, can you teach him? Because I don't, it's just like everything is wrong with that. And I think at the beginning uh-huh. of the book, Sentado would have been like, yep. Like, it's a, a job's sure. a job. Been so passive, I'll do it. Right? It like, doesn't matter. Told to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but he was like, no, I don't want to do that. And I think that that was kind of a big step for him. So I, I was happy about that. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that's how life changes happen, or at least Mm. sustainable ones. Mm -hmm, You know what I mean? mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we make big, there are big things that change our lives. But I feel like a lot of times, like, being happier, I don't know how to phrase (laughs) this, taking care of ourselves, I think, starts sometimes with those, like, really little things, right? Like, yeah, I mean, and quitting his job is not a super little thing. It was a big decision for him. No. Because this whole point has been about, you know, money, and he's in debt or whatever. But it is, like, kind of a small thing, the nephew, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're right, past Centauro would have been like, I guess this is my job now. And now it's like, oh, wait, do I actually want to work with this person and train him? No, I don't. And yeah. he's, be, he's taking a step to be much more active. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Were there any other parts of the book that stood out to you or that you wanted to ask or talk about? I was wondering, mm-hmm. this is not necessarily about the book, but because it goes into Hansen bio, mm-hmm, Hansen's mm-hmm, disease, mm-hmm. Hansen's disease so much, um, I was wondering if any schools in Japan like used this in their curriculum mm. at all. That's and a so question. I don't have an answer to that, I, but I was like really curious about it. Like, I could see this class for something. sure as being yeah. like something that a high school would use mm-hmm. in a language arts class or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see that. I I think um, I really liked it. I felt like the first maybe 50 pages or so were really what I was expecting from the book. It was like mm. real life situations, like very mundane things. We're learning baking, about the characters, cooking. baking, cooking, relationships. Clearly there are some secrets we don't know about. It felt very Japanese. It was like, very lighthearted I mean not lighthearted but like mm-hmm. it was light and it was light. yeah I kind of was expecting from the cover from the back of the book from a lot of things that that's how the story would continue um mm-hmm. I when we learned that like Tokue had this dark secret or like something happened I was just expecting like 
a secret child or like you know maybe an Mm. illness but like I wasn't expecting the whole story to get derailed by like yeah not only illness but as we've been talking about like society's perceptions of people with this illness and like the structure of the community like the entire story moved to revolve around this thing that I wasn't expecting so I loved the book I think it's great for like a book club discussion for a class but with the first 50 pages, I would have recommended it to anyone. But now I think I would mm-hmm. be a lot choosier unless it was in mm-hmm. one of those contexts about being like, are you ready to read this? Like, is this? <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think those parts also came across as, I don't know if heavy handed is the right word, but like clearly the author has an agenda, right? Yes. Like, yes, for sure. They for want sure. you to know about the history of this discrimination yes. and like they want you to be very informed about specific yes. laws. Now I am. Specific acts yeah. that were repealed. And now I am. <laughs> yeah. And so it definitely is like that is the, the author has an agenda, right? Yeah. I think it's a good agenda. Yeah, yes. definitely. But it did feel different to me than just like maybe a typical novel. Yes. Yeah, for that sure. That I would pick up and read. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if I think if someone knows going into this, right, like that it's also going to be a little bit like, I don't know, educational, a little bit. Yeah. Heavy handedly informative. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's good. I think I would mm-hmm. recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. do you think so? Obviously, I have a background of some Japanese knowledge and you have so much Japanese knowledge. Do you think that someone, a lot, do you think someone who has never studied Japanese and doesn't really know anything about Japan, do you think it would be as enjoyable or understandable? Or do you think that there are so many cultural things embedded in the writing and story that it might be harder to invest in? I think that the relationship piece of the story would be just as Mm -hmm. touching, Mm -hmm. would be just as good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that some of the imagery specifically around food, dorayaki and okonomiyaki and, yeah. you know, sweet bean paste, I think that would be a little bit harder. Because I know what dor- dorayaki is, and I yeah. know you do too, you can imagine, right, like the grill, like it's... Exactly like how the shop is. Yes, 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 yes. And I have had both like store-bought sweet bean paste where you just like squeeze it out of like a plastic bag and then make whatever in it. That's like what I've used at home when I've used it in cooking. And I've also eaten it at like confectionery shops, right? Like waga, like traditional wagashi places. Well, they clearly made it like that morning. It's clearly yes. like they made yes. it that morning. And it definitely tastes different. And you're like, the whole thing tastes different, right? And you're like, this is amazing. And I think because I have that point of reference, it was like the visuals, like the imagery yes. was so much yeah. stronger yeah. and the cherry blossoms, right? And mm-hmm. And I think if you had never heard, if you've never seen cherry blossoms in real life or you've never, you know, smelled, tasted, seen dorayaki before, I think you could still enjoy it and, you know, kind of imagine it, but it would definitely would be a little bit different than mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. someone who has that cultural knowledge. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? No, I agree. I think it's not that you would like miss out per se, mm-hmm. but I do think it was a lot richer for having the mm-hmm. background knowledge that I did. Yeah. But now it I like... It made me really want to eat Dorayaki. I know, me too. I also really want you to go and read the original version in Japanese and then report uh-huh. back and tell me how different the vibes are between the translation and the original version. So you know, please and thank you. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. And then we'll finally know what Marvie's name is. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh well amber thank you for joining me um and having this wonderful book discussion and for choosing this book i was so happy to have read it. i i do not think i would have independently picked this one up but i'm so happy that i read it so thank you yay <laughs> good i'm glad we could read it together and discuss it and also you know have this image of Dora, delicious yes. homemade dorayaki in the back of our minds yes. together. Yes, <laughs> for sure. All right, Amber, thank you for joining me today. See you next time. Thank you. Matanya, thanks, Bye. Maddie. <laughs>